voices rise, all creation cries, singing out in endless hallelujah. From this moment on, join with heaven's song, singing out in endless hallelujah. I would like for everyone to open up the Word of God. I know we love the Word in this house. It's not so much what I can say because you know I'm, some pastors are really great at entertaining. Um, I'm, I'm, I just this is this is where it all comes from, and this is all that really matters in the end. It's not what I say; it's what the Word of God says. Amen. So, um, all right. So today we're going to end up. If you've got your Bibles, please uh, go ahead and turn to Luke 19. And it's uh, we're going to be on verse 28, and we're going to get into this. But before we do that, we're going to today's message is Palm Sunday. Now you have to understand that here uh, the previous messages, which I've loaded up on YouTube, except for actually I've got to to load the the last one I believe still. But but we've been tracking along. God's been laying down the breadcrumbs, and for us in this house, we've been trying our best to follow the Hebrew calendar. And, um, you know, we know that that everything, including Palm Sunday, which is very, very, very significant, I think it's actually an overlooked, one of the more overlooked, um, reckon, the things that we recognize just prior um, to Jesus going to the cross. This is very, very significant because he, and we're going to get into the why it's important. Um, I end up learning that um, it's the Orthodox Jews that actually have a celebration where they celebrate Lazarus Saturday and then Palm Sunday. And I thought that was interesting to me. I was like, my goodness, they, they, they really go out of their way. They literally have titled it and they, they celebrate in that manner. And it's not that, and I've kind of dug in there to kind of understand, well, what are they trying to do? Because I don't like edification of flesh, but no, it's not that at all. They recognize the fact that, that, as we talked last week, Lazarus' resurrection was of God's order. And um, it's all part of the process because he was redeeming mankind, and that's what that represents. It was us, the flesh, you know. And to be born into the kingdom, we have to, um, we, we, it's by water and by spirit, as, you know, as, as Jesus had told Nicodemus. And the baptism part of it all that we do, the mikvah, you know, you'd have to really kind of go back Sundays to understand that a lot of the correlations in John 14 where he says he prepares a place for us is what the Jewish traditional marriage does where there is a contract given, there is a betrothal, there is a mikvah where the groom and the, and the bride um, are immersed in the water. And that's what we know as baptism. In fact, in the Jewish Bible, it's John the Immerser instead of John the Baptist. But it all means the same thing, immersion. So it's the water and the spirit, but that's the physical. We're in the physical world, and so that is representative of the physical. And so when Lazarus was resurrected, that was symbolic of mankind. And you know what's amazing to me is that's our good God. What did he do? He did that first prior to him even going to the cross and being, re being resurrected himself. Ultimately, as you know, when you read into Revelation, and we're going to kind of get into that at the end, um, it's all about us being one in Christ and Christ within us. And it's just a beautiful thing. But I love how all this, all these events that happened prior to him going to the cross is very strate st strategic. And it's all in his order to tell mankind something through it. And, uh, and so here we are. And this happens, you know, Sunday, Palm Sunday, traditionally is a week prior to, to the resurrection on Sunday. Um, and that's why we're doing the, the message today. Next week, of course, we'll have the actual resurrection Sunday. 
And, um, you know, so it's, I'm, all this I'm learning, so throw a grace card at me. I know that some of y'all are a little more, you know, been thought, you know, you're, you're further along in the, uh, on the, on the kingdom trail than, than me. And then some of y'all have been going, you understand a lot of the Jewish feasts and this, which I'm understanding more and more and more. Um, but I just think, man, wow, how beautiful is this? And how many church houses today are, you know, are, have missed so much by not understanding what, what Jesus was trying to teach through, through, the, through those things. Amen. So, all right. So Jesus says, in fact, in John 12, 1, it said Jesus was anointed at Bethany. And this anointing happened at a, um, when he was right after the Lazarus event. In fact, if you go to John 11, um, is when they talk about the resurrection of Lazarus. But I find this interesting that Jesus was anointed there because literally right before he, before Palm Sunday, he's anointed. And, you know, they used oil to anoint kings. And how awesome was that? Remember, you know, Mary anointed Jesus. And uh, anyway, it's beautiful. And, uh, and, and it all signified that he was a, he is a king. And um, all right. Are we, are we going to see that first slide again, or no? Is that the only time? Um, no, I it, it, I clicked the wrong button here real quick, and so. Uh, but what I want to point out is some of the things here. Um, I've got some other information I'm going to share with you. Um, Palm Sunday is the Sunday before Resurrection Sunday, or which is also known as Easter in a lot of houses, which begins Holy Week. And this is why I've got this up here. Now, I, I am in agreement for most everything. There's, there's, a, there's, a one, there's only one question mark I have on this, but, but it was important enough for me to, to show this because I felt like, man, that's pretty cool, the graphics and the, uh, and the different days there that they went through. And we're going to go through some of these here. But um, I love this because, you know, basically the anointing of the king, which happened you know, after the Lazarus event prior to him coming into to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, the, that direction, um, it, you know, they ended up taking off their garments. And the branches was a customary way of honoring a person such as a king. Um, this is similar to today's version where they roll out the red carpet, you know, for dig, dignified individuals. Although I don't find uh, Hollywood as being... Uh, uh, Fallen in that category, but um, as you know, as the story goes, these people that ended up seeing Lazarus, a lot of them that were there had seen Lazarus being resurrected. Now the people there wanted to be delivered, and they wanted a king. They wanted a physical king to deliver them from the slavery that and the bondage that they were underneath the Romans. And of course when they saw the power that Jesus had in resurrecting even the dead, they wanted Jesus to literally use that power to overthrow the Romans so then they would then have a king and you know a government and it was the wrong type of government and Jesus was the wrong <laughs> individual for the for what they were trying to uh, to, to look at him as. And as you know, as the story goes, the people ended up the same ones who were showing all this respect and honor to him by putting down, you know, with the palm trees and uh, the leaves, the fronds, um, what that signified. Literally, it wasn't just days later that they were crying out, crucify him. Um, I find that very interesting because... Um, I think there's a whole other story there. You know, pick your friends, right? <laughs> you know, some of your friends are not really there for the right reasons. Uh, so Monday, Jesus cleanses the temple. And uh, you can see the, the graphic there on Monday. Monday, he cleanses the temple. Now, I find this very, and he also curses the fig tree. Um, I find this very, very important because with deliverance, as you know, we, we believe in deliverance here. 
and with deliverance, it was that's actually that was the scripture that started it all with me in particular. Is when I read that scripture, the Holy Spirit showed me that it was Jesus with the authority to cast out an unwelcome spirit that was in God's house. Amen. <laughs> and he flipped the tables, and it was the it was the new thing. Remember, that's where God used to dwell. That temple, the Spirit of God didn't dwell in. By the way. Um, the Solomon was the last one, but this one was not. And the thing is, is he cast this out and said, this is the wrong spirit. This is, that doesn't supposed to be here. He flips the tables. But this was the old way of things where Jesus became the new covenant. Of course, the veil was torn and the spirit of God then dwelled where? Within us. We are the new temple. And so we must also flip the tables in our temples and make sure there's the right spirit within us. Amen? So anyways, very significant thing. That's why it's there on Monday. It's prior to him going to the cross. Um, so worth mentioning. So Tuesday, uh, from that time till Tuesday, Jesus teaches in the temple there for three days. Wednesday... Judas is first betrayed, and this I, I find this very interesting because this, this actually happens before the, um, the Last Supper event because, you know, betrayal happens in our hearts first, even before the act itself. And so anyways, that's what Wednesday. Thursday, Jesus offers his body and blood in the Last Supper, which celebrates uh, Passover meal. Now, here's the thing. I, I like this graphic because it goes over all the key events. But I personally, now, it, it, you know, here's the part where we, we had earlier, and I said I would speak a little bit too. There's the verse where Jesus said that he was in the ground for three days and three nights, you know. And so you're trying to put your finger on the actual day that Christ was crucified. Well, we do know that the Jewish calendar, you know, um, from, from six in the evening to six the next day is, the, you know, the day starts at the nighttime, right? You know, sundown. right at the sundown, and then you roll it back. But we know that it was in twilight hours that they found Jesus. So, you know, if you roll that back, and then you and you roll it back three days, there's this Thursday that I've now listen, and it's okay if you have a different whatever. But this is just this is my take. Okay, this is how I'm reading things in this moment, and I've read this a few times to try to understand this. But I really do believe in the three day, three nights. I think if it was just, you know, some people think, oh, that's just, you know, parts of those days. But I would really believe in, in what it says literally. So if you roll that back, Thursday, Friday was a high Sabbath, which was not a typical Sabbath. And I believe the scripture supports what I'm saying here is it being the high Sabbath. Of course, Jesus then remained. Um, he went to hell to get the gates of hell and then he was resurrected in the twilight hours as it says as we're going into Sunday so that's how I, I see it but what I'm saying is, is some of these days when we talk about this these are significant events and it says on Thursday Jesus offers his body and blood and last supper um, which I guess you could say that that still falls along because if he ends up offering it he, he dies that day but then um, but here it says on Friday Jesus dies on the cross but regardless if it was this day or that day, I think we have to just believe, right? That's all it says, that we just believe that he died and he was resurrected. That's, that's really bottom line. But I like to always dig in. That's just me. I like to try to really, you know, and I'm still learning. But, um, but I believe in the three days, and if you count those back, and then you look at um, the ladies when they ran out to get perfume, and, uh, you know, Joseph of Arimathea, that dialogue there gives you clues of, of, you know, and then the high Sabbath day, if you really dig in, you can see how all that goes. But we know that Jesus died, and then, of course, on Sunday, he was resurrected. Now, did I get everything that you were looking for there, honey, on that? Did I cover what you were looking? Yes, I was just, okay. I was just like, filling out. Before yeah, we I do too, and that's that's why I wanted to present. I think a lot of people lose sight of how much happened each a lot. day leading up to That's right. And it's called uh, Passion Week. They also call it Passion Week as well. But anyways. All right. Palms. Do you know that, that our God loves palms? <laughs> and, uh, and this is very interesting. Here's why. Um, it says this. In Egypt, there was a tradition of people carrying the palm 
to funeral processions as it represented eternal life. So palm trees represent eternal life. What else? It says the palm branch was also a symbol of spiritual triumph over death. The palm branch is a symbol of victory, triumph, peace, and eternal life. So when you go to the beach and you're like, ah, oh, wow, look at these palm trees, how beautiful. Well, there's, there's peace there. And it's, and it's even more so. And you see here that it's even on the back of their, their, uh, the coin um, here. And um, it's interesting to note that, of course, remember the dialogue where he says, pay unto Caesars what is Caesars and you know, pay in to God what is God's. Um, Pontius Pilate, which is the Roman governor, would come into Jerusalem with his soldiers for Passover, showing his strength through the arms his men carried. Jesus, however, came in on a donkey with all his disciples unarmed to demonstrate the counter-opposite kingdom that he was bringing. He was the Prince of Peace. It was customary during that time of peace, a king would actually ride on a donkey, while a king would come sitting on a white horse after the victory in battle, as suggested in Judges 5, 10 and 1 Kings 1, So Jesus came as king, but not to judge the people. He came to demonstrate that he was the king of grace, of peace. Um, and we are still under under that. We're under His grace, and at this point, um, and I thank God for it. So the palm branches really was symbolic um, during that time. Ezekiel forty one twenty three through twenty six says this. This is a description of the sanctuary. Both the main sanctuary and the holy place had double doors. Each door had two leaves. Two hinge leaves for each door, one set swinging inward and the other set outward. The doors of the, the main sanctuary were carved with angel cherubim and, what does it say? Palm trees. There was a canopy of wood in front of the vestibule outside. There were narrow windows alternating with carved palm trees on the both sides of the porch. So with everything and, and, and you know all this, even the palm trees itself fit within God's order. And um, I find that very interesting. Also, did you know, Palm Sunday is fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. See, that's, that's the good God, that's the living God that we serve. Literally, the living God will tell us in moments of something that happens for the day, but also it ha it's, it's also for the future. And here in Zechariah 9.9, 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Well, we know daughter of Zion, and they're speaking of Israel. Uh, we know Mount Zion. It says, O daughter of Zion, shout in triumph, a daughter of, of Jerusalem. So it tells you exactly who we're talking about here. See, your king comes to you, Righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fall of a donkey. So, how could you miss this, right? He was coming as such, and, and those who actually read the scriptures, and, the, and back then, guess what was the number one thing on why they would miss their Messiah? Well, they were reading the scriptures, and guess what? How much will we miss today? just the same. They breathe air like we breathe air. It's because we, we, if we're not reading the Word of God, then we'll miss it. The, also, also spiritual blindness. The Pharisees knew the Scriptures inside and out. That's yeah. true too. Which, should, which really, that, that should have been... Um, if they really knew the Scriptures though, in a lot of ways though, you would think you know, there was an unclean spirit within a lot of them and that's the reason why Jesus ended up saying what He said, you brood of vipers. You know, but the thing is, is um, the, how many pastors today do you think are, are still missing it on a lot of things? And I'm not, and it's not a poke in the eye. I'm not trying to do that. But what I'm saying is, uh, the people perish because it's a lack of knowledge. And without the reading of the Word of God, 
There is a lack of knowledge. I don't think the average person had a tour <coughs> scroll either. <coughs> tour scrolls were very expensive and hard to get, so oh, the average yeah. person didn't have anything to read. Well, that's true. They del they they really depended on yes. on the priest. Yes, they did. Which we know that the you know that position for during that law period, it was vital for the priest to really do things by the word of God. Yeah. Um, they were the shepherds of the day, yeah. and they obviously failed because many of them didn't even recognize the Messiah, even though it was prophesied so many different places throughout the Old Testament. All right. This is where we're starting with your Bibles in Luke 19, 28. If you've got them, uh, you can read along. Um, I believe this version, we normally do a Jew Jewish version or either the New King James Version. Um, not, I'm, I'm not that I'm totally hung up on versions, but I like those two mainly. Um, the triumphal entry. In verse 28, so follow along. It says, When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass... And I love that because when it says that, that means it was an appointed time. When he drew near to Beth Bethage, all right, and Bethany, at the mountain called Avlet, which is the Mount of Olives, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite of you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied, on which one has never even sat. Loose it and bring it here. Now, I love when I see loose it <laughs> because as we're doing deliverance, that's what we do. There's, there's binding and loosing. And, um, and here, the donkey was going to be freed because the donkey was there for, and he was part, that donkey was part of God's order. And uh, even the donkey knew it and believed and, and did, you, know, you don't see any fight from the donkey. And you, then we don't see any fight from the owners. But I find this interesting. If you don't believe that God has prepared the way for you in this day and hour, look at this. Look, what, look how detailed our God is. And even at this moment, um, having a donkey prepared. And he gives clear instruction for his disciples. Have you seen a donkey that's marked with a cross? I don't know. Has anybody seen this? This is I have. I've personally seen it many times. It's, it's remarkable. You can't help but see that that is certainly a cross on the donkey. And so when I see this, I think it's just another way that our, our, our good God marks and gives us signs of things that need to be communicated to a lost world. Um, anyways, I want to put that in there. I thought that was pretty cool. So keep an eye on uh, a donkey with a cross. They, they do exist. I've seen them many times. So it says this in 33, But as they were lo loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosening the colt? That's pretty much like someone taking the keys in your car right out of your driveway. <laughs> and they said, The Lord. Ooh. Now we say Lord here, but it's like Elohim spirit. Adonai. This is... The Lord, this is the ultimate authority, has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus. So it says that it was done. And they threw their own clothes on the colt, and that and that they set Jesus on him. And of course, the throwing down the clothes, as we know, is a symbolic gesture of, of someone setting out. Um, something that's that's uh, it's, it's to show humility for someone who is very important and uh, it was their king and they saw him as king so it says and as he went many spread their clothes also on the road would you allow I mean I visualize this when I read this I just visually graphically see it I mean it's like us taking our clothes and having a donkey on a dirt on a dirt road, more than likely, um, to trample on our clothes. You're not going to just do that for just anyone. So in 37 it says, then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, 
the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Those are actual words that Israel is going to say again at some point. Of course, unfortunately, much of that segment of Israel, is going to, their knees will be bent to kneel. But nevertheless, they will come to a place where they speak these actual words and recognize Jesus as the Messiah, their king. The angel said that to the shepherds, too. That's right. Amen. All right, I've got a short video for you to watch. I love this. It's, it's short, but it's beautiful. I think you'll enjoy this. Amid shouts of praise and the waving of palm branches, Jesus triumphantly entered into the city of Jerusalem. This event marked the beginning of the most significant week in human history. Understanding the historical setting of this singular event can teach us of the ultimate mission of the Savior as the Lamb of God and the true King of Kings. To better understand the importance of the triumphal entry, it is helpful to first understand its correlation to the feast of Passover or Pesach. Passover was the first of three major Jewish feasts celebrated each year. The feast was to commemorate the deliverance of ancient Israel from bondage in Egypt. According to Exodus 12, the Lord commanded Israel to select a lamb without blemish on the 10th day of the first month. Once selected, the lamb was then brought into their homes to live with the family for the next four days. On the eve before the start of the 15th day, they were then to kill the lamb, smear the blood on the doorposts, and share together the Passover feast. If they did this, the Lord promised that the destroying angel would pass by them and spare the firstborn of the home. Every year afterward, Israel celebrated Passover to remember the great deliverance from bondage. In addition, the Jews at the time of Jesus were looking forward to a coming Messiah who would hopefully likewise during Passover deliver them from their Roman oppressors. With this background in mind, let's study the events of the triumphal entry. Shortly before Passover, the Savior began his last mortal journey to Jerusalem. Like Jesus, hundreds of thousands of Jews were also arriving to celebrate the feast. With the city swelling beyond capacity, many would have camped on the Mount of Olives and surrounding areas. Jesus chose to stay in nearby Bethany with the family of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, whom he had just raised from the dead. News of this remarkable miracle spread like wildfire. The promised Messiah had come. As the Savior and his disciples climbed over the Mount of Olives, with the temple glistening in the morning sun, the people cut branches from palm trees, waving them excitedly, and laid their garments on the ground to cover his path. The significance of the timing is unmistakable. According to the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the day Jesus entered was the 10th day of the month, five days before Passover. This would mean that on the very same day that the Jews were selecting their Passover lambs, Jesus, the true Lamb of God, rode into Jerusalem and was symbolically chosen by the people. Also, just as the lambs would be brought into the homes of the people to stay for the next four days, so too Jesus came into his father's house, the temple, and taught for the next four days before his death. This act of worship by the Jews during the triumphal entry fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah which stated, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey. Sadly, as the week progressed, the Jews saw that Jesus did not come as the conquering Messiah they had hoped for. They realized that Jesus would not bring them the political deliverance they so desired. 
Yet they did not understand the true deliverance he would bring through his atonement, death, and resurrection. Only five days later, some of this same crowd who had previously shouted praises at his arrival would now shout for the death of the Lamb of God. Often we are faced with the same question as these Jews in Jerusalem. What type of Messiah are we hoping for? One who will immediately free us from all our challenges and trials? Or are we humble enough to trust in the Lord's timing for redemption? In essence, we all have our own personal Exodus story, a story where we are in spiritual bondage and can be released only by the blood of the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. We each have the opportunity daily to select Jesus Christ as our Lamb of God and allow him into our homes. When we lay down our all before him, as the Jews laid down their garments, shouting Hosanna, we choose to accept the Savior, seeing him for who he really is. Only then can we, like ancient Israel, be spared from the destroying angel of death and sin and enter into the promised land because of the triumphal entry, death, and resurrection of the Lamb of God. Wasn't that beautiful? Oh. Every time I watch that, I it just... It's awesome. All right. It's the King of Grace. That's, that's our King who loves us. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Philippians 2.8, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You know, the four days of Passover when the family brings in the small, cute lamb that has no blemishes, those four days, the, the children, even the parents, get attached to that perfect little lamb. And I don't know, and I didn't carry out this 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 uh, Palm Sunday message. I, sometimes I'll I'll put up a picture of a little lamb, but man, they are so cute. And to think that I mean, you would you would go way out of your way <laughs> if we had a lamb run out into the traffic here. We would we would easily run after it and try to protect it. But to think you know killing its life because of because of our sin. That's Jesus. It's so beautiful. In Romans it says, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight. Not one, even though we are created in his image, there's not one justified in his sight. Since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. I love the manifested word. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's what we, see, we can now see. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, as we know Jesus fulfills it, the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. We receive the righteousness just by simply believing in what Jesus did in the shedding of his blood. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned. I just said this the other day. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In Daniel, he has a vision. And what's interesting is um, this vision that, that's given to Daniel, this is a description of our king from the Old Testament. This was prophecy, a vision given that, that was prophetic, uh, that Jesus would, would then, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll see this, this donkey being reintroduced during those, these, these future days of Palm Sunday. So it says this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. <laughs> there you go. 
There's the title. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Revelation 19, 11 through 13 says this, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness... He judges and makes war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine white linen, or fine linen, white and clean, and that is the church, that is us, follows him on, a white, on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Did you know that the wrath of Almighty God is not for the believer today? And I think... I think God for it. And he has on his robe and on his thigh written, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is so beautiful. You just keep following it. After this, I looked, and there before me was a huge crowd, too large for anyone to count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language. They were standing in front of the throne and in front of the Lamb, dressed in white robes and holding what? palm branches in their hands and they shouted victory to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is a beautiful description of our King. And there will be another time when He will come in the same route that He came, the Mount of Olives. But instead of on a donkey, He's going to come on a horse. And um, we, we need to take this time today to share the love of God so they can understand. I mean, we still have time. Um, he's still on that donkey. So we need to share the love of God with others while we still have the time. So with that, thank you, God, for Palm Sunday. And I hope maybe that's stir, stirred you up a little more with that. And uh, we're going to go ahead and have the Lord's Supper. Let our voices rise, all creation cries. Sing Hallelujah, from this moment on, join with heaven's soul, sing out the endless, hallelujah.